Right. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. The time is now 18.30 South African time. My name is Tom Mokorosi. I am the training coordinator of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Welcome to our presentation of Cricket South Africa's Level 1 umpiring course. Before we start, I shall take you through our meeting protocols. Please put your microphone on mute and turn off your camera. Uh, that is to save bandwidth for those people who are using their telephone hotspots. We will be presenting for an hour to an hour and a half and questions will be taken at the end of the presentation. You can write down your question in the meeting chat box during the presentation so as not to forget the question. When the question and answer session starts, raise your virtual hand, turn on your microphone when prompted to ask your question. Uh, we might go over time during the question and answer session. You are welcome to leave at any time. The meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available to everybody on our YouTube page. Please, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to all mute your microphones uh, so that we do not disturb the lecture. Um, please just bear with me while I mute everybody's microphones. Right, so those are the meeting protocols. Uh, flashing in red is the muting of the microphone, please. Just as introduction, myself and my co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, are members of the Cricket South Africa National Panel of First Class Umpires. And we are also uh, in the Western Province Cricket Umpires Association Training Department. Abdullah is the head of training, and as I've mentioned, I am the training coordinator. We will be taking you through um, seven lectures in the next three weeks and a bit, and then you will have your online exam. So this is what our timetable looks like. Our lectures are mainly Mondays and Wednesdays in October. The third week, apologies, I think it's the second week, you'll see that there is a Tuesday rather than a Monday. Uh, that is because Abdullah will be in Potchefstroom umpiring the Cricket South Africa Division 1 T20 competition. We will be able to follow him on television. Um, so he's got a match on Monday evening, and that's why on Tuesday, the 18th of October, we will have a lecture on a Tuesday and not on the Monday. The seventh lecture on Monday, the 24th of October, will be a revision lecture. We will be going through uh, only the slides that are tested in the Cricket South Africa Level 1 exam. And we will also have a click-by-click -click demonstration of how to register for the exam and start answering the exam. The lectures are free and you are able to watch them live or on YouTube as per the recordings are loaded two hours after each lecture. Uh, if you wish to write the online exam, the exam fee applies. It is 300 South African rands for uh, South Africans, and it is 500 rands uh, outside of South Africa, or uh, 30 US dollars that you can pay via PayPal. I have emailed all of you uh, the details of how to make payments, and those payments are due on Friday, the 28th of October. And what will then happen is on Saturday, the 29th of October, all of you who have sent me your proof of payment to training at wpcua.co.za 
will receive an exam link email from umpires universe and you will have a 10 day window period in which to attempt the exam up to five times until you pass the exam and the pass mark is 80 percent there are 69 questions all true or false or multiple choice questions and so you need to get at least 56 out of 69 questions correct to pass the exam. What happens when you pass the exam is I will get emailed your certificate. It will go to training at wpcua.co.za. Depending on what time of the day that happens, I will forward you the certificate as soon as I can so you can expect to get it within 12 hours of you passing. Note that you are unable to have more attempts at the exam uh, once you pass. So if you get 81%, that's it. You won't have a chance to improve your mark uh, after you have achieved 80% or more. Then passes of the level one exam will get emailed after the window period closes on Tuesday, the 8th of November. You will be emailed details of how to join Western Province Cricket Umpires Association if you so wish to do, and if you reside in and around Cape Town. If you reside in South Africa, but outside of Cape Town, uh, let us know what town or city you reside in, and we shall put you into contact with the Umpires Association in your area. If you reside outside of South Africa and you wish to join an Umpires Association, uh, we do have contacts around the world uh, with uh, quite a few Umpires Associations in various countries so you just need to let us know which um, town and country you are located and you will then be given the contact closest to you and in fact just for interest sake i would love to know where everybody is joining us from this evening um, i know it is uh, half past 12 midday in the east coast of the United States. So I will start off by piping in into the chat box uh, where I'm from. And if everybody else can follow my example, we can get a little bit of interaction going. So Cape Town, South Africa. So while you all type in your locations, uh, I just need to stress that the Cricket South Africa Level 1 umpiring qualification is widely recognized in Africa. It is also um, recently been accepted by the Abu Dhabi Cricket Board uh, as an entry level to umpiring in Abu Dhabi. Uh, they are also currently working on uh, Dubai to have Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring qualification accepted um, as an entry level. Um, I know in the Netherlands, there's a few of you uh, dialing in from the Netherlands. Uh, our Cricket South Africa level one, two and three uh, qualifications are also recognized in the Netherlands. And uh, we are also working currently with the United States Cricket Umpires Association to have Cricket South Africa's level one, two, and three recognized and accredited in the US. So uh, please guys, don't expect that with Cricket South Africa's level one exam or level one qualification, you will walk into uh, umpiring anywhere in the world. Um, it is not that straightforward currently. Uh, we are working to try and um, get it accredited by all cricket playing nations uh, but of course there's a fair bit of red tape to get through before that happens 
Uh, however, it is, uh, as you all know, um, South Africa is one of the strongest um, cricket playing nations in the world. And uh, Murray Rasmus uh, was in 2021 uh, voted the International Cricket Council umpire of the year uh, and he's got cricket south africa level one two and three qualifications under his belt um, so obviously they must carry uh, a fair bit of weight internationally so what happens when as a south african you join western province cricket umpires association i'm going to take you through a career path to become a professional cricket umpire and what i need to stress is that not everybody can make it to the highest level there are only 11 members of the international cricket council elite panel of umpires um, so that is 11 out of how many billion people in the world at the moment i think it's eight billion people so only a select few make it right to the top. What structures do we have in Western Province Cricket Umpires Association? We umpire in uh, Western Province Cricket Association leagues from the Premier Division men's uh, down to First Division 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Uh, those leagues have uh, either 12 or 10 teams. So on any given Saturday, we have 54 umpires uh, umpiring league cricket in and around Cape Town. And um, there is also schools cricket that uh, we are now getting appointed matches to. So we've got a membership currently of 120 members. And when you start, you start in the lower men's divisions, first division D and first division C, and also in the women's promotional league. And over the years, you shall be moving up the ranks to first division C, B and A. If you perform well, we have assessors that uh, rate your performance. The assessors are uh, former umpires, so they know what to expect from an umpire's performance. And also we have captain's reports uh, after each match that the captains fill on the performance of each umpire. Uh, so that way uh, your performance is monitored by the association. And if we see uh, potential in you, uh, we might nominate you to a uh, Cricket South Africa age group tournament, boys under 13 or girls under 16. And if you do well in those two tournaments, then you would be moved up to boys under 15 or girls under 19, and then boys under 17. Uh, in the middle column, you can see then there is a red line below that red line are what we know as elite amateur tournaments. Uh, Coca-Cola under 19 boys week and the women's provincial week. Um, there you are not nominated by your association to go to those tournaments, but you are picked by Cricket South Africa to go to those tournaments. OK, and that is why, as you can see in the next column, uh, you are now part of the Cricket South Africa pipeline umpires. There are various uh, other senior tournaments uh, listed there, um, one of which is currently on the go, Varsity Cup. It started this morning in Pretoria and that is your first taste of televised um, cricket matches that you would be involved in and is very exciting uh, for your family and friends to watch you in action. Um, once you have reached Community Cup and Varsity Cup as well as Academies Weeks, those are the top three uh, competitions for amateur umpires. 
then Cricket South Africa will invite you to write your level four exams. Um, over the years, you would have upgraded your qualification from level one to level two, from level two to level three. You can do it within one year, you can do it within two years, you can do it within three years, entirely up to you. You drive your own umpiring career. Uh, level four is by invitation only. So uh, we as uh, Western Province Cricket Umpires Association, we have this course for level one, then we have uh, coming up in March 2023, we will have level two online as well, as well as level three in April 2023 online. Uh, that is as far as you can go with us. Uh, and if you are in South Africa and you are umpiring and you do do well, uh, then if Cricket South Africa feel that you are ready for first class cricket, then they will invite you to uh, write their level four exam. And once you've passed that, then you will go on to Cricket South Africa's reserve panel, uh, where there are 12 umpires currently. And if you do uh, well in division two cricket, uh, then you will be promoted to Cricket South Africa's national panel, which is where I've mentioned myself and Abdullah currently are. Uh, then you can umpire division one provincial cricket and you can go on to uh, SA under 19 matches, uh, SA women's matches, uh, SA emerging and SAA uh, inbound tours. Uh, we also have an exchange program with uh, New Zealand, Australia and India where Cricket South Africa umpires go to those three countries and then we have uh, first class umpires coming from those three countries uh, to umpire in South Africa. Obviously, uh, that hasn't happened in the last couple of years due to COVID, uh, but we're all hoping that that can restart again in 2023. Um, what I will also go through is on the next slide is uh, opportunity for um, amateur umpires to come to Cape Town and umpire in our club cricket uh, leagues. Uh, and there it will really be on a um, social basis, not a professional level, uh, but it is an opportunity for you to spread your experience uh, and experience different environments in which to umpire. Uh, so keep your ears and eyes open for that detail if you are interested in visiting Cape Town and possibly umpiring during our season. Uh, just a note that uh, the cricket season in Cape Town and South Africa is generally from the beginning of October, so it's just started for us and goes through until the end of March and there is a three week break uh, for Christmas and New Year's, usually between the 18th of December and the 8th of January. If you do very well on Cricket South Africa's national panel, uh, the top four on our panel, they do international matches in South Africa, men's international matches. Uh, and then if they do very well, then um, they can be promoted to the ICC elite panel. As mentioned, uh, we have one representative from South Africa on that panel at the moment, uh, Marae Rasmus. Um, I just noted a few umpires in the last column, and this is really just to show you that it takes different times or different lengths of careers to get to different places. Um, so Abdullah and I are at the similar level. Uh, I've been umpiring for 15 years. Abdullah has been umpiring for 12 years. Uh, Warren Weingard, who's also uh, based in Cape Town, uh, he's a former first class player. So he was fast tracked through the system and 
is at the CSA's reserve panel after only five years of umpiring. A few of you might remember Stian van Sale, who played test match cricket for South Africa. Um, he only umpired for two years and he was already uh, in the elite amateur tournament uh, stage. Uh, so former first class players are fast tracked through the system. They know the pressures that are involved in the highest level of the game and also know what is expected of an umpire at the highest level. Um, then you will find uh, Bongani Jele. He doesn't have much playing experience, didn't get to first class level. So he's taken 23 years um, to get to uh, Cricket South Africa's international panel. Uh, he started umpiring at the age of 13. So I encourage all of you to start early and uh, to give it all you've got to make a profession out of it. Um, Aladdin Palika uh, made his test match debut in December 2021. He is our uh, poster um, pinup boy for this particular course, and he will be joining us uh, next week, Monday, and we can have a question and answer session as to how it took him and how many years to get to become a test match umpire. Um, so that will be an exciting question and answer session next week, Monday. So moving on to the exchange program that I uh, mentioned. Uh, if you want to come to Cape Town, what is the procedure? Firstly, you need to pass a uh, Cricket South Africa level one, two or three umpiring exam with us. So you are busy with uh, level one at the moment. Uh, as mentioned, the exam window period will be from Saturday, the 9th of 29th of October until Tuesday, the 8th of November. Um, so once we have the window period closed, uh, the night of Tuesday, the 8th of November, I will email all of you who have passed uh, an application form to join Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Now, you should only um, complete that application form if you uh, live in and around Cape Town or when you have bought your plane ticket to come to Cape Town and wanting to umpire on holiday. Um, and I need to stress that it is going to be a holiday um, and not you coming to work as a professional umpire in Cape Town. Um, I've written on here the match fees that we get paid at club cricket level. It's 175 rands for an under 11 T20 match, and it goes up to 500 South African rands for a men's Premier League match. Uh, that is not a lot of money. You can uh, go to Google to translate it into your own currency. Uh, you cannot make a living out of umpiring um, amateur cricket. Uh, so you must just see it as part of your holiday and you must uh, come for the experience rather than the money. Um, so just a little bit of logistics in terms of how it would work. Uh, when you fill in the membership application form, uh, there is space for you to write the dates that you will be in Cape Town for. Uh, so then our match secretary will be able to appoint you uh, to matches over the weekends that you are available in Cape Town. Um, I suggest you book accommodation using Airbnb in Cape Town southern suburbs. Why? Because uh, there is a lot of cricket fields in these areas and the famous Newlands Cricket Ground is also where we have uh, most of our meetings. So. Um, the suburbs are Observatory, Mowbray, Rosebank, Rondebosch, Newlands, Claremont, 
Kenilworth and Weinberg. So you can, in your Airbnb uh, search, uh, type in any one of those um, suburbs and you will find what the prices are per night, per week, per month to stay in Cape Town. Uh, you need to apply for a tourist visa. Uh, most countries, uh, if you're coming to South Africa, you would need a tourist visa. And note that it's a maximum stay of 90 days. You will mainly be appointed to matches on Saturdays and Sundays. There are very few midweek matches and the few midweek matches that there are, um, they are pretty much prioritized for our um, members who do not have um, office jobs or have retired. OK, so you will not be umpiring Monday through to Sunday and making a lot of money through umpiring in Cape Town. Uh, that is unfortunately the reality of the situation. And you will be paid cash after your last match, less 500 rands membership fees and any amounts for any clothing that you have received from the association. Uh, we have caps, we've got standing shirts, and we have got uh, hats as well. Um, best to use Uber to travel to and from matches. It's safe, it's easy, it's convenient. And please, I reiterate that we do not have the um, capacity in terms of admin to uh, write uh, invitation letters uh, for uh, visa applications. So you need to take care of that yourself. We do have a gentleman from India, Harsha, who uh, comes every summer. Um, so those of you interested, I will uh, give him his permission. Uh, when I send out the link to um, the recording of this lecture, I will add his email address and you can ask him um, how he applied for his visa and how difficult or easy it was and uh, any other questions uh, regarding the visa application to him because I don't need a visa to come to South Africa because I live here. Um, so I wouldn't be able to help you with your visa application questions. OK. So that is uh, quite a mouthful in terms of how you can umpire in Cape Town, uh, but I hope some of you are willing and able to join us and you are most welcome as soon as you pass your level one exam. Um, what we will do is we will, for record purposes, allow you uh, to have a copy of the captain's reports that uh, you um, officiated in those matches. Uh, so that will be the official record for you to use back in your home country to show that you did umpire in Cape Town, South Africa. Right, so now we can move on to the presentation. And if you have a law book, you will soon see what it looks like. You will know that there are 42 laws of cricket, which we will be going through in these first six lectures. And at the front of the law book, before you even get to law one, you have a preface which is called the spirit of cricket. Now, what is the spirit of cricket? Simply put, Cricket owes much of its appeal and enjoyment to the fact that it should be played not only according to the laws, but also within the spirit of cricket. We often hear commentators mentioning that uh, that piece of cricket was a great piece of spirit. The major responsibility for ensuring fair play rests with captains, but extends to all players, umpires and especially in junior cricket, teachers, coaches and parents. The law book tells us that respect is central to the spirit of cricket. Players need to respect your captain, teammates, opponents and the authority of the umpires. 
You must play hard, but play fair and accept the umpire's decision. Let's watch a little video on the laws of, oh, sorry, on the spirit of cricket. And this comes from the um, website of Mary LeBone Cricket Club, which is um, at Lord's Cricket Ground, the home of cricket, also where the lawmakers sit and change the laws uh, every now and then. Um, you will notice that the law book says 2017 code on it, but uh, the latest edition is a 2022 uh, edit. And that is the laws that we are taking you through. So fresh off the press. Abdullah, please let me know if there is no sound on the video, but I think there should be. Well, the spirit of cricket is about going out there, giving your all 100%, fighting against the opposition, but doing it with a smile on your face and doing it with enormous respect for the beautiful game of cricket. Hold him. Middle stump. The way you conduct yourself on and off the field, it's about respecting the opposition and respecting the game. You embracing the game, yes. But, but also how you play the game, how, what example you are for young kids growing up. Big shot, and he's gone as well. I think the spirit of cricket is about respecting the traditions of, of what's been before us and those who have been before us as well. And, and as cricketers, we've got, we've got a duty to make sure we uphold those. You know, you let your skills go to work when you play, but you, you treat each other and, and the game itself, um, which has been around a lot longer than us, um, with respect. And, and you hope that you leave it in a better place than what you started with. Now, playing it hard, playing it fair, and you're representing your country, and we're very, very privileged. You should cherish that. It's obviously competitive. No professional international sport isn't. And um, you would never want to lose that competitiveness from any of the players because that's what makes the game as good as it is. But it's obviously a line in terms of doing it the right way and doing it the wrong way. And I think it's one of the important things when trying to, I guess, inspire people to play the sport. Yeah, just conducting yourself in a way that probably your parents and your grandparents would want you to. I think that's probably the easiest way to uh, describe it. Um, obviously, after what happened in, in South Africa, you know, I know those guys really well. And I know that they're not proud of that and, and they made a mistake. And unfortunately, that's something they're going to have to live with. Because at the end of the day, he made a mistake, but he's still a very good person. Everybody will make a mistake at some point in their career, but it's about repairing those mistakes in future games and learning from your mistakes. Yeah, there's no doubt about still being competitive and still wanting to win, but yeah, certainly you can win and lose in the right manner. But I think out of that, you know, we've, we've thought a lot about just respecting the game and everything around the game and just putting the focus back on just, just playing the game. This is a really closely fought semi-final, um, kind of went down to the wire and you obviously kind of have a moment of celebration, but then your, your thought quite quickly turns to the opposition. It wasn't, it's obviously not something you think out or anything like that. It just kind of seemed like the, the right thing to do at that time. Uh, we lost a test match against England, um, which was a cracking test match. Oh, I thought. Oh, 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 Ali, Ali. Oh. Played between two very, very good cricket teams, playing aggressively but playing in the right spirit. And after that test match, we sat in the English dressing room, as the losers do. They go through to the winners' dressing room and shared a beer with them. And, and um, for me, it was just encapsulated everything which, which was good about the game. I remember the Ashes Test match in 2005. For me, the most iconic one is the 2005 Ashes, uh, when uh, Freddie Flintoff obviously consoled Brett Lee. Jones! Bowden! Then he was sitting down, and uh, when Flintoff went to him and shake his hand, I think that's the spirit of cricket for me. Yeah, that for me is the iconic moment. Kind of the result obviously went England's way, but he took the time to console a bloke that put in a hell of a performance. It'll be something like, I want to tell you, I have a great admiration for you and the way you guys played this match. So 
show you know you respect for the opposition end of the day it's just a game of cricket but uh, i think that's that's the spirit of uh, cricket for me but you actually together you sit down together and that's the spirit of cricket friendship So what do we as umpires have to do with the spirit of cricket? As the slide mentioned, the responsibility lies with the captains and the players of the team to play the game within the spirit. Us as umpires, we are there to officiate within the laws of cricket and as I mentioned, we're going to be taking you through the 42 laws in the six lectures. What we need to do or what we can do as umpires in Wazoo, we can always encourage the captains to play within the spirit of the game. So a example is um, I'm sure a lot of you have watched or seen on social media the uh, run out of the non-striker by uh, Dipti Sharma, the Indian um, all-rounder against England uh, last week sometime, and um, always been seen as a controversial mode of dismissal. The playing conditions for International Cricket Council matches uh, now say that umpires should not ask the captains if they would consider withdrawing the appeal and we would we will go through appeals in detail in law 31 uh, however at club cricket uh, we do encourage umpires if there is a controversial um, appeal like for running out the non-striker by the bowler or a obstructing the field appeal. We encourage umpires to ask the fielding captain if they are happy to go through with the appeal or if they would like to withdraw the appeal because sometimes it could be the bowler uh, that wants that controversial mode of dismissal to take place, but the rest of the team does not want that controversial mode of dismissal to take place. So thereby us as umpires asking the fielding captain if they want to consider withdrawing the appeal, that is us encouraging them to play the match within the spirit of cricket, but we are not able to force them to withdraw the appeal. So that takes us on to our laws and I will be covering law one today and then Abdullah will cover law two, three, four and five and that will be it for this evening and then we shall continue from law six on Wednesday. So law one is to do with the players. How many players in a cricket team? I'm sure you all know. A match is played between two sides, each of 11 players, one of whom shall be captain. And you will see that there is a relationship between captains and umpires that flows throughout the laws of cricket. So we need to be aware of that relationship and how we engage with captains throughout the match. Now you'll see that this next paragraph is highlighted in green. So what we've done is we know the questions that come up in the Cricket South Africa level one online exam that you will be partaking in and the text throughout the presentation that is highlighted in green is examined in the Cricket South Africa level one exam. So always 
make specific note of any text that is highlighted in green because it's going to be tested in the exam. OK, so this is our first bit of uh, important information to note for the evening. Uh, by agreement, a match may be played between sides of fewer than or more than 11 players, but not more than 11 players may field at any time. So I'm sure you all know South Africa played against England in a test series about a month ago. And before the test series started, uh, South Africa played against England Lions, which is um, effectively the England A side. And to try and get all 15 of South Africa's squad members ready for the first test match, uh, all of their eight or nine batters batted in that match and all of their seven or eight bowlers bowled in that match. Um, so 15 players played in the match for South Africa, but they were within the law that says no more than 11 players may field at any time. OK, so that's the important part of the restriction of number of players in a cricket match is how many can be on the field at the same time. If during the match and for whatever reason a side is reduced to fewer than the original number of nominated players, the match shall continue as long as it is possible to do so under the laws or any agreements made before the toss. So let me talk a little bit about any agreements made before the toss. And this is where I'm going to differentiate between the laws of cricket, which we are covering, and the playing conditions for a specific match or tournament. So in Western Province Cricket Association, we have a playing condition that says if after 30 minutes after the scheduled start of play, a team does not have seven or more players, then that team will forfeit the match and the match will not take place and the non-defaulting side will get be awarded the match and the uh, number of winning points will be awarded to the non-defaulting side. So that is not in the laws of cricket as we are looking at them now. That is a playing condition for all tournaments regulated by Western Province Cricket Association. So we are only going to present the laws of cricket to you. However, um, we will sometimes um, relate some experiences and some examples to playing conditions because you will see on television, for example, uh, when a bowler bowls a short pitch delivery, also known as a bouncer, and the ball goes over the striker's head. Um, what is it called by the umpire? I'm sure you all know it is called a wide. That is a playing condition for International Cricket Council competitions. You will be surprised to know in Law 21, which is the no ball, that a short pitch delivery, also known as a bouncer, that bounces over the head of a striker is to be called a no ball, not a wide. OK, so there are some times where the law is different to playing conditions. Uh, so you just need to be wary of those differences and remember that the exam is based on the laws of cricket, not any particular playing conditions. OK. This is what a team sheet looks like, and this is how we nominate our 11 players in club cricket in and around Cape Town. 
Each captain shall nominate his or her players in writing to one of the umpires before the toss. Okay, that's highlighted in green, so we know that it's going to be examined in the level one exam. No player may be changed after the nomination without the consent of the opposing captain. So quite often uh, what happens is teams you will find out later in the laws that the toss takes place 30 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled start of play. And obviously, after the toss, the team sheets are exchanged, or at least the team sheets are exchanged just before the toss or at the toss. Um, there will still be some warming up by players after the toss before the start of the match. So what the law is saying here is that if there is an injury to any player who is on the team sheet for either team, then to replace that player, the captain of the uh, injured player would have to ask the opposing captain if they are able to replace the player, in effect, scratch that player's name off the team sheet and put in a new player on the team sheet that will be allowed to execute all disciplines of any other nominated player. So that player can bat, bowl, um, keep wicket, and even captain the side. Okay, so that wouldn't be a substitute who just fields. That would be a fully nominated player. But that permission has to be granted by the opposing captain, not the umpires. Okay, quite interesting. Any replacement player shall be considered the same player as the nominated player he or she replaced for the purposes of these laws. A replacement player shall not bat in an innings in which the nominated player he or she is replacing has completed his or her innings. OK, so that's obviously if the replacement happens um, within the match, uh, not before the match. In Law 24, we will come to penalty time. Uh, penalty time needs to be served if a player is off the field. They need to be back on the field for the amount of time that they were off the field before they can bowl again. So the law says that any unserved penalty time Warnings or suspension that apply to the original nominated player will be inherited by his or her replacement. And again, ladies and gentlemen, please remember that these are the laws of cricket. The playing conditions for international cricket uh, differ slightly to this in that uh, the playing conditions have the new player free of the warnings and the penalty times or suspensions of the player that he or she has replaced. Let's talk about the captain and our relationship as an umpire with the captain. If at any time the captain is not available, a deputy shall act on his or her behalf. If a captain is not available to nominate the players, then any person associated with that team may act as his or her deputy. At any time after the nomination of the players, only a nominated player can act as deputy in discharging the duties and responsibilities of the captain as stated in these laws. So thank you very much. Um, that is my presentation for this evening. Abdullah will take us through laws two, three, four, and five, after which 
we will open the floor to questions and answers. And if we can please try as far as possible to keep the questions related to the laws presented this evening uh, or any of the um, course admin that I mentioned up front, as well as the exam um, admin. And of course, uh, you are also welcome to ask any questions about uh, exchange umpiring in Cape Town. Um, so I will chat to all of you later. Um, now I'm handing over to my co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, to take us through laws two, three, four, and five. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tom. And good evening, um, everyone. Law two covers the umpires. And in terms of appointment and the uh, attendance, the governing body usually appoint two, uh, two umpires uh, per game. And it's important for those umpires to be at the ground 45 minutes before play is about to start. If the game's supposed to start at 10 o'clock, according to the laws, the umpires, both umpires, needs to be at the ground at at least 9.15. We will see in, in later laws why it's important for the umpires to be at the ground at least 45 minutes before play starts, because there's lots of duties that the umpires needs to perform before the first ball gets bowled. But we will go through those duties in detail in later laws. Are we allowed to change an umpire during once the game has started? Uh, yes, the law allows uh, the change of an umpire. So if the umpire be, becomes injured or ill, the law allows the umpire to be changed. Uh, but if there is a, a change of umpire, the replacement umpire to only act as the strikers in umpire, unless both captains agree that this replacement umpire can take full responsibility as an umpire. So yes, you're allowed to change the umpire due to injury or illness, uh, but if the umpire uh, is changed, he, uh, he or she can only stay in a striker's in unless both captains agree for the new umpire to take full responsibility. For the game starts, there are certain things that you need to consult uh, with the captains. Some of these uh, things um, are determined by the governing body, but some you do need to discuss to discuss with the captains before the, the play before play starts. So when it comes to the balls to be used during the game, we will go into detail uh, under law number four that covers uh, balls. So the balls to be used during the game, the governing body decides that. Same applies to the hours of play, the times and duration of the intervals and drinks. Governing body also, also set those times. Boundary of the field of play, you need to uh, discuss and whether any obstacle within the field of play is to be regarded as a boundary. Example, at some school fields, you'll find, you'll find rugby or soccer poles uh, inside the field of play. You need to discuss that with the captains. What are you going to do if the ball should strike while in play um, the rugby or soccer poles? And in terms of allowances for boundaries, the governing uh, body of cricket usually decides that, and today it's uh, usually uh, six or four uh, in terms of boundaries. The user of covers also needs to be discussed with the captains um, at club level if there are covers available, and it and if rain uh, is imminent, you can discuss with the captains that both teams needs to assist with the covers. And if there are any special conditions affecting the course of the game, you also need to discuss that with the captains. And lastly, any discussions you have with the captains 
and please inform the scorers as well. Fair and unfair play. So who decides when play is fair and unfair? Is it the coaches? Is it the captains, the players? No, the, the umpires, they are the sole judges of fair and unfair play. We do have a, a, a specific law, Law 41, that covers unfair play. And in level two and three, we will go into detail uh, with regards to unfair play. In level one, unfair play is not examined, so we won't go through it. But in level two and three, we will go into detail. But in terms of who judges fair and unfair play, the umpires alone. Fitness of play. So who judge whether the, the, the ground is fit to play? Similar to, similar to unfair play, the umpires together, they solely decide whether the ground is fit or unfit for play. So what do they take into account? So the, the umpires need to, to together decide whether the conditions of the ground or, or, or if it's weather or light or any exceptional, exceptional circumstances means that it would be too da dangerous or unreasonable for play to take place. Again, this is highlighted in green, so there is an exam question on point six and seven. So the two key words in, in 7.1 is dangerous or unreasonable. We will go into detail in the next slide what the definition is of what is dangerous or what is unreasonable. But that is what uh, the two umpires together need to take into account is whether conditions are either dangerous or unreasonable. The fact that the grass and the ball are slightly wet, this does not warrant the ground being regarded as unreasonable or dangerous. Sometimes you find a little bit of dew um, early, early morning or there was a little bit of rain around and the ball, uh, the grass is slightly wet and the ball gets slightly wet. You will not uh, uh, say this is, uh, or regard this as unreasonable or dangerous. So let's get to the definition as per the law of what dangerous or unreasonable is. Let's start with dangerous. The law tells us that the two umpires shall regard conditions to be dangerous if there is actual or foreseeable risk to the safety of players or the umpires, or even I can include the ground staff here as well. So actual foreseeable or foreseeable risk to the safety of players, umpires, or ground staff. Example of this, if there are lightning around, that is an example of an actual uh, safety risk. In that in conditions, if there are lightning around and you feel you need to uh, leave the field of play, that is seen as dangerous, you are then allowed to suspend play. The other word that we use was unreasonable. So what is the definition of the law? The law sees uh, the definition of unreasonable as something that happens, even, it, even though it poses, it poses no risk to the safety, but it would not be sensible for play to proceed. I had an example of this. I was doing a first-class game in Postestrum a few years ago, and there was a dust storm that came across the, the ground. Uh, there was lots of dust and sand in the storm. Uh, umpires were coughing. Sand was going into our eyes. Uh, same applied to the fielders uh, and the batters. No one was in danger, but it was not sensible, sensible for play to continue. So we called time. We then uh, players and umpires left the field of play. We waited for the dust storm to, to go past the ground once, uh, once it was passed we then allowed play to resume. So that's an, an example of conditions being unreasonable. So the two words again, umpires needs to ascertain whether conditions are dangerous. And I gave you an example, lightning is an example. 
and the other word is where the conditions are unreasonable and an example of that is a dust storm other things that uh, umpires needs to con consider is when the ground are so wet or slippery as to deprive the bowler of a reasonable foothold the bowler running in to deliver the ball needs to have secure landing the f you need to uh, allow the fielder's power of movement the batter should be able to play these strokes or run uh, freely between the wickets if these conditions are not possible then you should regard the conditions as being dangerous or unreasonable for play to take place so what happens in terms of a suspension of play in dangerous or unreasonable conditions so now the two umpires together have decided that circumstances or conditions are dangerous and unreasonable so what the umpire should do is let's say you're on the field of play and there's lightning around the umpires now consider this as being dangerous the two umpires shall immediately sus suspend play or the uh, or the um, in the previous slide i mentioned uh, uh, conditions being um, let's say muddy on the field um, bowlers don't have a secure foothold in those instances you, uh, you've, you will not allow play to to start or to recommence so if play is in progress and the umpires do not agree about about conditions play shall be immediately suspended so what this means is let's say you're on the field of play and there are lightning imminent and one umpire feels no i think the lightning are still a uh, kilometers away and the other umpire feels i think this lightning is close the lord tell us if there's a disagreement you need to leave the field immediately both umpires need to agree to stay on the field if there's no agreement according to the law play shall be suspended immediately now the two umpires have decided to suspend play now it is the responsibility of the umpires to regularly monitor the conditions the, the two umpires should not go to uh, the dressing room and close the door and sit there it's important that the, the two umpires regularly monitor the conditions the two umpires together needs to make inspections as often as appropriate and importantly the two umpires together alone needs to make these inspections players coaches or anyone else should not be around it's two umpires alone to do the inspections and for them together to decide whether yes the 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 conditions are still dangerous or unreasonable and they'll inform the captains that we will not start play or if they do decide that it is no longer dangerous or unreasonable they shall then inform the captains that play will resume position of umpires so where do the umpires stand the law doesn't give an exact position where the umpire needs to stand all the law tells uh, um, us as umpires is you the umpire needs to stand where you can best act upon any decision that you need to make so the law tells us that the bowlers in umpire needs to stand in a position as not to interfere with either the bowlers run up or the strikers view 99 percent of the time the strikers in umpire needs to stand on the off side of uh, oh, sorry on the on side of that is 99 percent of the time strikers in umpire needs to stand on the on side of, of the pit there are times where the strikers in umpire may decide to stand on the off 
side of the pits. Examples of, of those are uh, the late evening setting sun. If you do stand on the offside, the setting sun might be in your, uh, in your eyes. So it would then be better to stand on the offside so that you can have a clearer view of the popping crease and the wickets. Another, uh, uh, another example, the, um, if you do stand on the um, strikers in empire standing on the onside, there might be a silly point, uh, a leg gully, uh, lots of fields, uh, fielders around the bat. And it may obstruct your view of the popping crease and of the, the wickets. Then it would be best to go, to, to go stand on the offside of to go stand on the offside. Once you've decided to go stand on the offside, there are three people that you need to inform. You need to inform the captain of the fielding side. You need to inform the striker and inform your colleague that you are now moving from the onside to the offside. Just to give you an, an exam tip, uh, you can see this is in uh, this is in um, in green. So there is an in, in exam question um, on this. So so the question uh, can be they'll ask you if the strikers in umpire do elect to stand on the offside, do they need to inform the captain of the fielding side and the striker? So they ask you, is that true or false? Now, according to the law, you need to inform three people that you move to the offside. Captain of the fielding side, the, the striker, and the other umpire. Now, in the, in the exam, they ask you a true or false question. Do you need to inform um, the strikers in, can stand on the offside, if they inform the uh, captain of the fielding side and the striker, true or false? Yes, that is two-thirds true, because there's a third person that you need to inform the other umpire so in that case um, even though it's two-thirds true you need to mark it false because you need to inform three people that you're moving on to the offside that is just an exam tip i'm actually giving you a free mark in the exam let's watch a video of um, umpire getting into position That's better. Uh, it's a yes bank super sixes. But, uh, up against the uh, bowling machine. Umpire got the dancing shoes on Alim <laughs> Dar. Caught on the wrong side. Simon Telfel's telling me from the back of the com box. Keep an eye on that, Simon. Uh, just a video showing um, Ali, Alim Dar moving to the wrong side. He should have gone the other way for that um, tight single and close run out. Umpire changing ends. So in more day cricket, whether it's a five day test match, whether it's a four day provincial game, that we play in, in South Africa, whether it's three-day uh, three cricket, if there are more than one innings, the law tells us that the umpires shall change ends after each side has had one completed innings. So after both first innings has been completed, umpires need to change ends for the second innings. So at Newlands, there are two, uh, the, the um, there's the Kelvin Grove in, and then there's the Weinberg in. So if I start the first uh, um, the game at uh, the Weinberg in, and Tommy's at the Kelvin Grove in, after the first innings of both sides has been completed, Tom and I needs to switch ends. Tom now needs to go to the Weinberg, and I to the Kelvin Grove in. So where there's any disagreement or dispute. Umpires together, they make the final decision on the field. The law allows an umpire to alter 
his or her decision as long as that alteration is made uh, promptly. Uh, but as a bit of advice, uh, yes, the law allows it, uh, but uh, your reputation as an umpire, if you're going to start just changing your your decisions uh, in every game, your reputation um, is going to go through the roof. So I would think carefully before I just change my decision, even though the law allows it, but just in terms of your reputation as an umpire, the cricketing world is small. Once you've changed your decision, will 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 go around that Abdullah changed his decision uh, in last week's game. Players um, will then start putting pressure on every single de decision you have to make in the hope that you will change it because you've done it uh, last week. But um, law allows umpire to change his or her decision as long as it's made promptly. Signals. Let's go through the various signals um, in cricket, and we'll start from top and we'll move top left, and we'll move to the right. So when it comes to signals, the the um, who do we signal to? We signal to the scorers, uh, umpires, and scorers. I see them as one team. We communicate throughout the day. Uh, yes, we don't communicate verbally, but we do communicate via signals. And what are those signals? On the top left is the out signal. So the out signal, it's important that you lift your, your, your hand, your index finger above your head, whether it's your right hand or your left hand. I, I use my left hand to, uh, to signal. Uh, Tom uses, uh, he, uh, sorry, I use my right hand to signal, Tom uses his left hand to signal. Doesn't matter uh, which hand you use, but for the out signal, index finger raised above your head. It's important that it is above your head. We will see in two slides time why it's important for the out signal to be, uh, the index finger to be above your head. The signal of four, you, whether you're right hand or left hand, waving it in front of your chest. And the important thing of signaling for is you need to end up with your hand in front of your chest. Your hand should not be, you should not end up with your four with the hand um, outstretched because then the scorers might interpret that as a no ball. So the signaling of a four is of waving your hand in front of you of your chest with you ending up as the picture uh, so on the left that is where you need to end up after you've signaled your boundary four boundary six raising of the of both hands above your head um, with the used uh, your um, as in the picture as um, the picture shows uh, finger um uh, the index finger raised. I don't use my. I don't raise my index finger. I just raise my palms uh, uh, above my head. Doesn't matter as long as you raise both hands above your head. The buy signal, raising of either arm, and in this case, it's, it's the right arm with an open palm above your head. The leg buy is raising your your either knee, whether it's your left knee or your right knee, and you touch your knee with your with your hand. So whether if you raise your if you raise your your uh, right knee, then I what I do is I touch my right knee with my uh, right hand. And when signaling a leg by, make sure that you're not your body's uh, is not facing the scorers. Try to be Try to be square onto the scorer so that they can see your leg is raised. One short is as the picture is shown, either right or left hand. That's the signal for one short. Wide ball, both arms, side of the body. Dead ball, by crossing your hands in front of your body. That is the signal of dead ball, no ball, outstretched, outstretched hand parallel to the body. 
if you are canceling your signal where you put your hands where your right hand touches your your left shoulder and the left hand touches your right shoulder that is your where you canceling a signal new ball you take the new ball and you hold it up to the batters and the scorers and the last picture on this slide is penalty runs. There are two types of penalty runs. Penalty runs to the batting side and penalty runs to the fielding side. How do, we dis how do you distinguish between uh, how to signal penalty runs for batting and, and fielding side? For the batting side, you can either take your left hand or your right hand and you tap your top of your shoulder. So uh, how, I re how I remember it is um, tapping, batting. So when, the, when it's penalty runs to the batting side, I need to tap, needs, needs to be tapping, batting. That's how I remember it. I need to be tapping my shoulder. And if it's penalty runs to the fielding side, you just touch your opposite shoulder, but you, oh, you, but you keep your hands stationary on the top of your shoulder, like in the picture. In this picture, that is penalty runs to the field to the fielding side. If it was to the batting side, you need to tap same signal, but instead of keeping it on the top of your shoulder, you now you now tapping on the top of your shoulder. So when it comes to signals, uh, try to keep your signals uh, simple. Uh, do not try to um, um, be like, um, I'm not sure if, you, if, if everyone knows uh, Billy Bowden. Uh, uh, Billy Bowden was, uh, um, used to have uh, very unique uh, signals. Please do not try to copy Billy Bowden. Try to keep your signals as simple as uh, possible. If you want to copy someone, um, you watch Kumar Damasena. Um, I think he's one of the best sig signalers uh, um, uh, in world cricket. Another signal is the commencement of the last hour. We will deal with the last hour in later laws. So how do you signal the, law, the last hour to the scorers? By pointing to a raised wrist with the other hand, as in the pick. Level three conduct, if a level three offense happens on the field of play, two signals needs to be made. The first signal is where you put your hand to the side of your body and you raise your hand up and down uh, similarly to a, a traffic cop. So that is the first part of the level three signal. The second part of a level three signal is to raise your uh, two hands below shoulder height with your palm facing towards the shoulders. It's important that it needs to be below head level because if you're going to keep it above head level, it's, it's going to look like a boundary six. It needs to be two hands in front of your body below head level. If a level four offense happened on the field, Again, there are two signals, putting uh, uh, like a traffic cop, putting your, eye, your arm next to your body and moving it up and down, lowering it up and down. That's the first signal. And the second signal is by raising an index finger be, uh, slightly below head height. So now you can see why it's important when you do give the out, sing out signal, that the out signal needs to be above uh, the pointing of uh, um, your hand with the, uh, raising the index finger above your head. That should be your out signal because there is uh, the signal for a level four offense is, or the second signal is where raising an index finger held at shoulder height to the side of the body. So who do we speak to? Who do we signal to? We signal to the scorers. And when you signal to the scorers, you need, before play, uh, uh, before you allowing play to proceed, the scorers needs to acknowledge your signal. And we'll get to the scorers in the, in the next uh, law. 
But when it comes to signaling the scorers, the scorers needs to acknowledge your signal. There are times where there are more than one sig uh, um, signal in, uh, in one ball. An example of this is the bowler, bowler bowls a front foot no ball. It goes against the pad, batter playing a shot, misses the bat, goes against the pad, from the pad, it goes past the keeper and over the boundary. So how are you going to signal this? The law tells us you need to signal it in order of the events that occurred. And when you signal this, there are going to be three signals now. You need The scorers needs to acknowledge each, each signal separately. So in our example, the noble happened first. So you first signal the noble. The scorer needs to acknowledge your noble signal. Then you're going to signal leg by. The scorer then needs to acknowledge the leg by signal. And then lastly, you need to signal boundary four. And the scorer needs to acknowledge the boundary four signal. All signals are made by the bowlers in umpire. Only the bowlers in umpire speaks to the scorers. Although there are times uh, where a short run happens, and we will cover short run later in the laws, and if the short run happens at the strikers in uh, umpire, the strikers in umpire then needs to call and, and signal that to inform everyone on the field. But when it comes to signaling the short run to the scorers, who needs to do it? The bowlers in umpire needs to signal the short run to the scorers. Why? The sc scorers do not look at the strikers in. Scorers only look at the bowlers in. That's why only bowlers in umpire speaks to the scorers through the means of signals. When it comes to the co correctness of uh, the scores, important job of uh, umpires is that they need to make sure throughout the game of the correctness of the scores. So importantly, in more day cricket, as soon as you go for lunch or tea time or there's a interruption in place, let's say for rain, immediately go to the scores and confirm that both scorers agree with the number of runs, the wickets, and the overs. So the scorers. Two scorers shall be appointed to each game. And what is their duties? Scorers needs to record all the runs scored. They need to record all the wickets that are taken, and they need to record the number of overs bowled. So ideally, two scorers needs to be uh, appointed. Not always the case that you'll find two, uh, two scorers. Uh, sometimes something happens that there's only one scorer. That, uh, that is fine, but ideally, two scorers needs to be appointed, and they need to record all the runs, all the wickets, and the number of overs that are bold. The scorers, and it's important that they do sit next to each other. I, uh, I came to um, uh, many a club game um, where I saw scorers, one scorer sitting in, in a car and the other scorer sitting in another car. That's a recipe for a, uh, 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 for a disaster because I can guarantee you they're not sitting together, the scores will not agree. So please make sure that the, your scorers, they do sit next to each other and that they, they need to frequently check each other's score that they both um, agree. And importantly for umpires, once there's an interval um, or at the end of the game, please go to the scorers, ask them, if they do uh, agree, and if they do agree, all happy. If they don't agree, we need to find where, where or why they're not agreeing. And in the previous slide, I mentioned that 
in terms of acknowledging signals, it's important that the scorers, they need to acknowledge each and every single uh, uh, signal by the umpire. And if there are multiple signals from one ball, they need to acknowledge those signals separately. The ball. So what are the weight and the size of the ball? Let me start with men's cricket. According to the laws of cricket, the law tells us that the ball shall not weigh less than 155.9 grams and it shall not weigh more than 163 grams. So anything in between that is acceptable by the law. If you do find a, a ball that is 100 and, 149 grams and if it's a men's cricket game, that ball is not uh, allowed as per the laws of cricket. For women's cricket, uh, slightly uh, less. They, their balls needs to weigh minimum 140 grams to 159 grams. In terms of approval and control of balls, earlier I did mention that when it comes to balls, the governing body of cricket, they decide which balls to use. I'll use a few examples. In test match cricket, the governing body of cricket, who is the ICC in the International Cricket Council, they've only approved three balls to be used at test match level. Firstly, it's the Kookaburra turf ball. Secondly, the Duke ball. And thirdly, the SG ball. Those are the only three balls that's allowed at, at test match level. In, uh, in South Africa, uh, at provincial level, so Cricket South Africa, the only balls that Cricket South Africa approved for four-day cricket is the Kookaburra turf ball. At club level in the Western Cape, the, the, the um, balls that were approved by the governing body of cricket in the Western Cape, which is the Western Province Cricket Association, they've the, uh, approved the Kookaburra match balls for the, the Premier League and the Division I uh, leagues. For the Division Two II and Three and Four, they've approved the Inwe balls and, and lower the Protea balls are to be used. So the point I'm trying to make is when it comes to uh, balls, the approval, which balls to use, it is the governing body of cricket that decides which balls to be used. And all balls, they need to be in possession of the umpires before the toss. And importantly, the balls need to remain under the umpire's control throughout the game. So if it's a more day cricket game, as soon as the game, before the game started, starts, you need to collect the balls. You need to make sure that the, the correct balls are used for that particular competition. And both sides are using the correct ball. And then throughout the game, that ball needs to be in the possession of the umpire. So if it's a more day game, at the end of the day, uh, um, let's say at the interval, whether it's a drinks interval, you need to collect the ball. At the lunch or tea interval, collect the ball. At the um, end of day's play, you need to collect the ball. And that is what point number two is telling us. Why do you think this is important, that you do need to collect the ball? Two reasons why it's important. Firstly, yes, if you're not going to collect the ball, and if you're going to leave the ball in the hands of the fielding side, you can just imagine what is going to uh, to happen with the ball. Or what are the things they are going to do with the ball? That's the first reason. It's just to prevent the fielding side from trying to change the condition of the ball. So it needs to be in your posi position at each fall of each wicket, start at the interval and in interruption of play. Secondly, if you do, a, a, because you now have position of the ball, you obviously do look at the ball and you do need to uh, um, look at the ball regularly. And we're going to get to the reason why you need to look at that ball regularly. 
and to check the condition of the ball, we're going we're gonna to see that in two slides time, why that is so important. So when it comes to a new ball, either captain may demand a new ball at the start of each inning. So in more day cricket, two innings per side, new ball, captain may demand a new ball at the start of each innings, unless there was an ag ag uh, agreement made. But otherwise, e either captain may demand a new ball. So in more day uh, cricket, the law allows that after a certain number of overs are bowled, that a new ball can be taken, or there's an option for the fielding captain to take a new ball. So according to the laws of cricket, after how many overs? After 80 overs are bowled, there is the option for the fielding captain to select a new ball. Remember, is the option is there after 80 overs. Captain does not have to take up the option. The captain feels he or she would like to continue bowling with the, the current ball by all means. But according to the laws, there is the option that allows the fielding captain after 80 overs to take a new ball. So once the captain has decided, let's say 80 overs are done, and the captain decides he or she wants a new ball, the umpire shall then indicate the, uh, um, to the batters that the new ball is taken and to the scorers that the new ball is taken. Remember earlier, I mentioned uh, umpires taking possession of the ball and regularly look at, look at the ball and look at the condition of the ball. Now we're going to see uh, why that is important. So what happens if a ball becomes lost or unfit for play. What you need to do as an umpire is, if the ball becomes uh, lost, an example is uh, at the one field here in, um, in Cape Town, there's a, there's a river right next to the field and, and quite often the ball gets hit into the river. That ball is lost. So then that ball needs to be replaced or a ball might become unfit for play. When does a ball can be unfit? Maybe out of shape. Maybe the seam is starting to, to get a bit um, uh, loose. In those instances, the ball also needs to be replaced. So now it becomes important that you knew out the condition of the ball. Because the law tells us if the ball needs to be replaced, whether it was, whether, uh, whether it could not be recovered or whether uh, it had to be replaced because it was uh, unfit, you now need to choose a replacement ball and that replacement ball needed to have way comparable to that which the previous ball had received before the need for its replacement. So the ball needs to look as close to uh, how the ball looked before the need for replacement. So that's why it's important just to do to regularly look at the ball just in case it needs to be replaced. Then you know exactly how the ball looked, and from the spare balls you can you can then um, make a decision on which ball to replace uh, it with. And who decides when the ball gets needs to be replaced? Who decides it? The umpires alone decides uh, to replace the ball. You do captain, fielding captains has no say. The batters at the wicket, they have absolutely no say. It is for the umpires alone to decide on that replacement ball. And once they've made a decision on the replacement ball, all they need to do is to inform the batters that they've replaced the ball and to inform the fielding captain. They do not need to show it to the fielding captain and ask the fielding captain, Captain, do you, are you happy with this ball? They do not need to do it, They're, nor do they need to ask the batters, batters, here's the replacement ball, are you happy with the ball? They do not need to do it. They just need to decide on the replacement ball. Once they've decided, um, 
inform the batters and the fielding captain that the ball has been replaced and you toss it to the fielding captain or, or the bowler. The last law that I'm covering for the evening, the bat. So the bat consists of two parts, a handle and a blade. So the handle is where the grip is on and the rest is called the blade. So the handle, according to the law, the handle is to be made principally of cane and or wood. The part of the handle that is only outside the blade is defined to be the upper portion of the handle. And the handle can be covered with a grip. The law allows for, for the handle to be covered with a grip. Blade. Blade comprises of the rest of the bat. And point number two, the blade shall consist solely of wood. No other material is allowed. The blade can only be made out of wood. And this is the reason why, why this law was changed. In before 1979, there was nothing in the law that said the blade has to be made out of wood. Then what happened? Dennis Lilly came out to bat with a, an aluminium bat. And at that time, there was nothing in the law debarring, debarring this. Then the lawmakers added the section to the laws. They then said the blade shall consist solely of wood. So for any part of the bat, covered or even uncovered, and if you do decide to put materials on the bat, example, uh, uh, the, those uh, the batting tape, the batting tape that 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 batters use uh, just to cover small cracks on the bat. Uh, sometimes they put uh, um, toe guards uh, on the bat to, to stop the toe from from cracking. So if you do. If they do decide to put these uh, things on the bat, they should not cause unacceptable damage to the bat. And the law gives a definition of what acceptable, unacceptable damage is. It tells us that unacceptable damage is any change that is greater than the normal wear and tear uh, that is caused by the ball striking the uncovered wooden surface of the blade. Contact with the ball. So contact between the ball and any of the bat itself. The batter's hand holding the bat. Any part of the glove worn on the batter's hand holding the bat. And any of the additional materials like the, the, the batting tape or the, the toe guard. This shall be regarded as the ball striking or touching the bat. So, so if I can just go over the four bullet points uh, again. How does the ball make contact with the bat? The ball, any part of the bat, whether it's the, the handle, whether it's the blade, whether it's the toe guard, whether it's the back of the bat, whether it's the batting tape that's, uh, that's covering the bat. If the ball makes contact with any of those, and the the um, the goes through to the keeper, and the keeper takes the catch. The batman shall be given out a uh, court. Also, contact between the batter's hand holding the bat. So if so, if the ball goes against the batter's hand holding the bat, and the ball then pops up into the air and gets taken, let's say, by the keeper, the slip batsman can be given out. Any part of the glove worn on the batter's hand. The important part here is it needs to be the glove worn on the batter's hand holding the bat. If it if the ball goes against the 
the batter's hand not holding or not on the bat. That is seen by the law as part of the, the, the batter's person. And if it goes against the glove and that glove is, is off the handle, not holding the bat, and it pops up and it gets taken by the, the slip or the keeper, that shall be uh, not out. So important part here is that it needs to strike with the, the hand holding the bat or any part of the glove on the batter's hand that is holding the bat. And then the last bullet point, any additional materials like the batting tape or the toe, or the toe guard. Bat size limits. So how long can the bat be, be as per the law? The law gives us a overall length, a maximum length of 96.52 centimeters. So the whole of the bat from bottom till from the blade till top of the handle cannot exceed 96.52 centimeters. Yes, it can be smaller, but it cannot be longer. So all the law tells us that is the maximum length of the bat, 96.52 centimeters, and it's in green. So there is an exam question um, uh, on this. So in terms of the length, over a length, that is what the law allows. So the blade of the bat and these dimensions were added recently to the law. So for many a year, even prior to 2017, the law only had the width of the bat. The law said that the width of the bat should be 10.8 centimeters. So the width of the blade, 10.8 centimeters. That's all that the law said. So did and, and in conjunction with the manufacturers, people like um, the David Horners and the Chris Gales, if you saw their bats on TV, their bats, uh, because they've got such huge uh, arms, um, they could uh, use very heavy bats and you'd see the edges and, and the thickness of the bats were huge. But because there were no, there were no regulations on edges, on thickness, only low, on the only... Um, the only thing law tells us was the width, not more than 10.8 centimeters. The lawmakers felt uh, it was uh, not a fair contest between uh, bat and ball, so they brought in the following. They now said the depth of the bat should not be more than 6.7 centimeters and the edges not more than 4 centimeters. So now there's maximum width, maximum depth, and edges. These are the changes that the lawmakers uh, brought um, just to bring a more even contest between bat and ball. So just as we have uh, ball gazes, uh, we saw it in the previous pick under the balls where we do check uh, the whether the ball is uh, out of shape. We also have bat gauges to check whether the ball uh, come, uh, whether the ball adheres to width, width, depth, and edges. And an example of uh, bad gauge is this. So if so, you take the gauge and you put the bat through the gauge. If the bat goes through the gauge, it's a legal bat. If it gets stuck, then that bat does not adhere to the dimensions in point number two. Then that is an illegal uh, bet. Thank you, Tom. That is uh, law five. That's all I'm doing for this evening. On Wednesday evening, we will start with law number six. I'm now having, handing back over to you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdullah. We have covered the laws one through two, five today. We shall, as you've mentioned, cover law six and onwards on Wednesday. I'm going through now the chat box to see what questions we have. And once we've completed the questions on the chat box, then we will open the floor to our hands to be raised and for questions to be taken um, live. First question um, we've got this evening uh, comes from uh, K7. 
K7 has passed uh, South Africa's level three exam. What is the way to proceed to the next level? And what is the pay in that process? Uh, so K7, as I mentioned in the career path slide, umpires in South Africa, if they have done well in the elite amateur tournaments, for a number of years, Cricket South Africa will select them to write the level four exam. OK, it is by invite only. So. It is not something that we offer um, in terms of our online lectures and exams. And very few umpires in South Africa are actually in possession of a level four qualification. Uh, the 12 umpires on the reserve panel, as well as the 16 umpires on the national first class panel, uh, we have level fours um, and obviously retired uh, Cricket South Africa national panel umpires also have a level four qualification. Uh, it is not open to everyone. It is only by invite that South Africans are allowed to do level four. So unfortunately, you not being a South African, you cannot uh, proceed to level four. Uh, then K7 goes on to ask about accommodation in weekdays and weekends. I assume this is asking about uh, being on exchange in Cape Town. As I said, you will be coming on holiday to Cape Town that you will need to pay for yourself and you need to use or I recommend that you use Airbnb to book accommodation for yourself for however long you are planning to stay in Cape Town. Uh, the association Western Province Cricket Umpires Association is not paying for your accommodation, not paying for your flights, not paying for your visa you need to pay everything for yourself and you will just be paid for the matches that you officiate in at the end of your stay or at least after your last match and so you need to budget accordingly to have enough money for the amount of time you're going to stay in Cape Town for. Hope that answers your question K7. Ishak Kasim asks, is that by agreement between the captains? Um, I'm not sure, Ishak, what slide you're referring to. Um, Ishak, are you still uh, on the call? Could you maybe unmute your microphone and uh, elaborate on your question? Hi, Tom. Yes, I'm still in the on the call. It was the first. Uh, regarding the number of players. OK, but, but you explained it later on, so it's fine. OK, no problem. Thank yes, you. It is um, either would be in the playing conditions of the particular match or tournament, or if there are no written playing conditions, then it would be decided at the toss uh, how many players are playing in the match. So uh, K7 asks more questions about uh, accommodation and travel in Cape Town, um, all to your own expense. Next question, Avinash. The replacement player, should they be of the same skill? Uh, Abdullah, do you want to take that one for Avinash? Uh, yes, Tom. Thanks, Avinesh. Uh, Avinesh, according to the the laws of cricket, the replacement player do, does not have to have the same same skill. The captain either needs to needs to agree on the replacement player or or not to agree. The captain cannot put a a, a condition by saying um, I'll agree, but if that player is of the same skill, 
So, Avinas, that is according to the laws of cricket. There are playing conditions that governs concussion and COVID substitutes. That is something different. Uh, but why I'm bringing it in is that is where, where the playing condition states that when you do replace uh, someone due to concussion or COVID, it needs to be someone of similar skill. But that is a playing condition um, for concussion and, and COVID. But according to the laws of cricket, if a player needs to be replaced, you need the consent of the opposing captain. And that opposing captain either needs to give consent or not. The captain cannot say, I'll give consent on condition that is a, that it is um, that it is a, a player of similar skill. No, the, the, the captain cannot put that condition in place, either yes or no. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. A second question from Avinash. Um, and you spoke about if I can just ask for other candidates to be on mute, please. Um, Abdullah, you spoke about uh, rugby poles or soccer poles being in the uh, middle of a cricket field. Um, Avinash's question is related to that. If there is an obstruction in the ground which cannot be moved, what happens? Maybe you can speak about the tree in Peter mm -hmm. Maransburg. Uh, yes, Tom, I will. Uh, Avinash, again, thanks for, for your question. So when it comes to any obstruction that you'll find inside of play, earlier I used rugby poles um, and uh, soccer poles. You do find that some uh, provincial or even test grounds, I'm not sure what it is, but I know there's quite a few provincial grounds and one in particular in South Africa at the Peter Marisburg Oval in South Africa, where uh, the KwaZulu uh, Natal inland team plays their provincial cricket. There is a, a 30 to 40 meter tree, about 20 meters inside the field of play. So when it comes to these um, objects inside the field of play, we usually uh, go with what the custom of the ground is. That tree at this particular ground has been there for for hundreds of years so we go with the prevailing custom at the ground and at the peter marisburg oval the custom at the ground is if the ball should hit the tree any part of the tree whether it's the roots of the tree or whether it's the highest br branch of the tree and the highest branch is about 30 to 40 meters uh, um, um, high the custom at that particular ground is ball hits any part of the tree, four runs to be signaled by the umpire. So to answer your question in terms of if there is a stationary uh, um, object, like in the example I use a tree or rugby poles or, or soccer poles, go to the home site, ask the, the home captain, is what is the prevailing custom of uh, uh, um, if the ball while in play should hit uh, this um, object? And they'll usually tell you if it should hit the, the uh, like in Peter Marisburg, if it hits any part of the tree, four runs. If it hits the poles, um, uh, four runs or six runs. Uh, but also, when it comes to these permanent objects in the field of play, make your life also simple. If there is, let's say, uh, rugby poles uh, inside the field of play, make a decision. If it hits the, the rugby poles, you'll give four runs. Do not have two sets of rules. If it hits the top of the rugby poles, you'll give six. If it hits the bottom of the rugby poles, you're going to give four. Because your top and maybe the fielding or batting captain's top uh, might differ. Uh, rather make it simple. If it eats any part of the rugby poles, we're going to give four. So, so that agreement is made before the game starts. You'll inform the, uh, the both captains, you'll inform the scorers, so everyone is aware. Once the ball hit the rugby poles, it's four. Similarly to, similarly to in Pet Peter Marisburg, everyone knows if the ball is the tree, whether it's at the root or whether it's the highest branch, which is about 30, 40 meters, I, it is four. 
um, um, yeah, so do you just clear that before the, the game starts and, and, and that is the um, agreement and that is how the whole game should be played. Did I answer the question, Tom? 100% Abdullah, thank you. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, still from Avinash. Um, I can take this one. Uh, okay. If one side of the run-ups is unusable, uh, can the match be played uh, from only one side? So uh, like you mentioned at Newlands, we have the Calvin Grove end and we've got the Weinberg end. So if uh, the run-ups at the Calvin Grove end are dangerous or unreasonable, uh, can we bowl all the overs from the Weinberg end? Uh, the answer is no. Um, overs need to be bowled from opposite ends. Uh, and then one more question from Avinash. Um, how do we weigh the ball, Abdullah? I mean, uh, usually a new ball, there, there are, there are a, um, there's a weight written on it. You'll see it, if it's a men's ball, you'll see one, five, six grams. If it's a female uh, ball, you'll see 142 grams uh, written on the, uh, um, I don't go with a, with a, with a weight to, um, you know, to the ground to weigh the ball. Uh, I get guided by when I get the ball I, uh, and if it's a men's game, I make sure that it is, it is the ball for that particular competition. Um, and I make sure that it, it complies with the weight. So I check if it's a, like in South Africa, first class game, it must be a kookaburra turf ball. And it, uh, it must be between 155.9 and 150, 163. And usually the, uh, the makers of the ball, they do write the grams on it. You'll see 156 grams written on a new ball and you'll see 142 grams written on a a, a ladies a ladies ball did i answer the question thanks Tom? abdullah thanks abdullah and tom but uh, my question was uh when we are replacing a ball or when we are uh, really change suddenly we need to change the ball uh that was like if the ball is really heavy or something we don't know so should we consider that the ball is uh Sometimes the ball gets heavier if the ball was soaked in water and then dried up. Then we have to use the ball somewhere, something like that. Yeah. So when you when you're choosing a a replacement ball, so usually before the game uh, at uh, at this and provincial level, uh, we do have a selection of sometimes 10, 12, 15 um, spare balls to choose from. So that is a luxury at that that we do have at this and province and provincial. Uh, for the level and when you do decide to choose a replacement ball you need to go to your box of replacement balls and then choose one that is as similar to the ball that you had to replace so similar way and 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 tear i know at club level it's not that easy uh, replacement balls are, are not that readily uh, available but again you, you you get guided by the law you need to work with what you have so look at the replacement balls in front of you and uh, um, use the law look for a ball that had similar way and tear as the ball that needs to be replaced and once you find that ball you take it and and you play with it and uh, did, uh, yeah. did I answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Abdullah. And uh, but the previous question, right? If one side of the run up can be usable, it's usable. Uh, that question I have, I'm uh, I'm just a little curious because if there's a case that we cannot use that one end at all, that means then we should not uh, conduct the match at all. That's correct. Uh, we okay. cannot play if the field, the entire field, is not fit for play. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tom and Abdullah. You're welcome, Abinash. Um, next question is from Anil. A question on the order of signals to be executed to the scorers. I was under the impression that the penalty runs should be signaled before the signaling of other events. Please clarify, Abdullah. Avinas, uh, who asked the question? Sorry, I'm Tom. Was it Avinas? Anil. 
Anil, Anil, thanks for your question. Uh, Anil, the, the, the law guides us here. The law tells us that if there are several signals to be used, they need to be given in order that the events occurred. So if there's a, it's a, in the example, let's, let's put penalty runs uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, exam, in the example. So the, the um, bowler bowls a front foot no ball. It then goes off the pad and it goes to the fine leg, uh, fine leg boundary. Fine leg picks it up and fine leg throws it in uh, to the keeper. But he throws it a bit off, uh, he's, he throws a bit off radar and there was a helmet placed behind the keeper. And the ball then hits the helmet behind the, uh, the, the keeper. So now we get guided by the law, how we need to signal this. The law tells us in order of the events. So if order of the events, which happened first, the, the, um, the front foot no ball happened first. And then it went off the pad and you need to signal uh, the, uh, the leg bias, because if you're not going to signal the leg bias, uh, the, the scorers are, are, are going to assume that it hit the bat and they're going to give the runs to the, to the, to the batter. So you need to signal the low no ball. Uh, you need to signal leg bias. And let's say they've completed one run. The ball went to fine leg. And when the ball came in, they didn't complete this, uh, they didn't cross on the second run. So once the ball hit the helmet behind the keeper, and we're going to get to that under dead ball. So once the ball hits the helmet behind the keeper, it immediately becomes dead. And under law 28, we will also see that it uh, you you will give five penalty runs to the to the batting side. So now to come in terms of the order, so no ball happens first, you'll signal the no ball. The leg by, uh, you need to signal the leg by, and you need to signal the leg by to indicate to the scorers that um, the uh, the ball didn't touch the bat, and and penalty runs is something completely different. Uh, there's a special space in the scorebook for uh, for penalty runs, and then lastly you'll signal the penalty runs, and this is penalty runs. Uh, penalty runs to the batting side and you will turn to the scorers and, and place your hand on the opposite shoulder and, and tap about um, there's no minimum or maximum amount of tapping at the low, uh, you, so I would say about three to four times the, um, you can tap your opposite shoulder so to answer your question uh, and if we follow the law in the sequence of events that they that they that they've happened um, and that is how I will signal signal it to the scorer. Perfect. Thanks, Abdullah. The next question is from Declan, and I'll take this one. In your experience, at what stage or level would you say umpiring can be a full-time job or career? Um, so, Declan, uh, in South Africa, I can only speak about South African umpiring. Uh, the top 10 umpires in the country are contracted full-time by Cricket South Africa 12 months of the year um, so they are not allowed uh, other jobs and so that is when it becomes a full-time job in South Africa. Um, myself and Abdullah um, latest rankings were 11 for Abdullah and 14 for me in the country and we are on eight month contracts um, renewable annually uh, from September to uh, April every year uh, that covers the cricket season in South Africa and we still have full-time jobs outside of cricket so for us it is not yet a full-time job umpiring uh, very few are fortunate to have uh, the passion of cricket umpiring as their full-time jobs. Uh, next question, and apologies if I mispronounce the name, is from Sumi Ashish. And he or she asks, 
why is the replaced umpire only allowed to stand at the striker's end? Abdullah? Thank you. Thank you for, for the, uh, the question. So when a, an umpire becomes injured, uh, injured or ill, and that umpire's that umpire needs to be um, be re replaced. The law tells us uh, that both captains needs to give um, consent to that uh, replacement uh, umpire. So in 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 many of the games, if I use club cricket as an example, uh, um, um, two umpires get support gets appointed to uh, to the games uh, every weekend, and. And let's say the game has started, and if an umpire do become injured or ill, um, and that umpire cannot partake in that particular game um, anymore, um, and then there's only uh, there's only going to be one official ump umpire left. So what then tends to happen? There needs to be a a square leg, uh, so a strikers in uh, umpire, and usually we then take the uh, a strikers in umpire. From the from the batting side to, uh, to stand there, so there will only be one official uh, umpire and strikers in umpire from the batting side, because of the only being one official umpire, um, that that official umpire will do both ends for the rest of the game. And what I mean by both ends, both bowlers in. So that um, umpire will move from bowlers in to bowlers in for the rest of the game. And the strikers uh, in umpire will be a member of the of the batting side. And obviously, because the strikers in umpire is a member of the batting side, um, that um, um, there could be a bit of a, a, a biasness, a biasness towards uh, uh, from that umpire, from that umpire. Hence, you do not want that umpire to give that umpire. Um, full responsibility as an, as an umpire, because I can guarantee you, if that umpire, if the strikers in umpire, who is the member of the batting side, had now full power as an umpire, it, every single decision will, will be scrutinized. That's why we need neutral, impartial umpires to, uh, to officiate the, the, the game. Did I answer the question, Tom? 100%, thanks, Tula. Uh, next question is from Moazem. Uh, I'll take this one. What is the age limit to be a professional umpire? Um, in South Africa, we take level one candidates from the age of 13 years old. And in terms of uh, retirement, uh, professionally, mid 50s, is pretty much when Cricket South Africa um, requires umpires to stop umpiring at the highest professional level. Uh, at club cricket, we do have umpires over the age of 80 who are still umpiring. So there's no real limit as long as health still allows them to umpire, they can umpire amateur cricket. Um, so yeah no set age limit um, what uh, i didn't mention on the career path slide is that if you have not made it in south africa to the elite amateur tournaments by the age of 42 you unfortunately won't be progressing any further um, so that is a a little bit of a a hindrance for those who start umpiring late in their careers, they won't make it to the highest level if they are over 42 and haven't made it to uh, Coca-Cola uh, boys under 19 week, for example. Next question is from Declan. And I'll take this one again, Dula. Uh, if for any reason a match is called off or suspended, will the umpire still get paid for the match? Uh, Declan, uh, if you're appointed to a match and um, it is not called off or suspended the day before the match and you end up traveling to the venue 
uh, on the day of the match, then you will get paid even if the match is called off or suspended on the day. Uh, but if the match is called off or suspended uh, a day before the match is supposed to happen or earlier, um, and you are informed of that cancellation, then uh, you won't get paid for that match. The next question is from Norbert. I'll let you take this one, Abdullah. Uh, when signaling short runs, how many times does an umpire have to tap their shoulder? And second question, in the event there are two short runs, how does an umpire signal that to the scorers? Norbert, thanks, thanks for your, your question. So Norbert, uh, the the tapping the tapping of the shoulder, we, um, there's nothing in the law that tells you you need to tap it once, twice, three times. Even with penalty runs um, uh, to the to the batting side, where you also need to tap the the shoulder. The law just tells us, you know, that uh, tapping your uh, tapping the opposite uh, shoulder with your hand. So whether you tap tap twice three times or four times uh, when they spend the penalty run to the batting side there's no real uh, right or wrong answer i would say about three to four times when signaling signaling penalty runs to the scorers to the penalty run to the batting side when it comes to the short run so it's not really where you where you uh tapping so i'm not sure tommy if this was uh, uh if he was referring to short runs or penalty runs to the batting side, because when it comes to signaling short runs to the scorers, you don't tap your shoulder. It's just you just keep your your tip of your finger. Let's say you take your right hand and you put the tip of your shoulder of your fingers on top of your your shoulder. If you can visualize the the short run signal which we showed earlier in the slides, so it's not like you tapping the shoulder when you signal a short run you just you're just keeping the tip of your so of your fingers on top of your shoulder so that is how you signaling short run it's, uh, you don't need to to tap the top of your shoulder when signaling short run to answer your second part of your question i think tom you said um how do you signal two short runs was that the question correct yes yeah, so uh, it is um, at international and provincial uh, level, Norbert, it, uh, it is a bit easier because we do have radios and that radio with the radios, we can communicate with the uh, third umpire who in turn can communicate to the scorers to make sure that they've recorded the correct runs. At, uh, at club level, not uh, that easy. So you will, you will signal... Um, Penalty runs to the, uh, sorry, uh, short runs uh, to the scorers. Um, I, I try not to to shout from where I'm standing to the scorers. It will look a bit uh, village if I if if I do it. I try to to get a message to uh, one of the fields just to tell the scorers that there were actually two short runs in that run in 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 in, in from that particular ball. And let's say only one run should be allowed or or no runs uh, should uh, be allowed. But otherwise, what I do is. Um, I do make a note in my um, in my small little notebook that I have. I'll, I'll put down the ball number. I'll put down the, the the time that it happened. I'll put down the batsman, the bowler, and at the next interval, let's say at lunchtime or tea time, I will actually go to the scorers and I will ask the scorers, scorers, um, ball uh, over number number twelve, ball number three. Um, there was a short run. There were actually two short runs. I just want to confirm that you've recorded uh, uh, correctly that only one run should have been allowed or no run should have been uh, allowed from that particular ball. Just, just double check for me. Do you uh, Did you record one run? If, let's say that is the case. Yes, we've only got one run or no, we actually recorded two runs. Should it be one? Yes, it should only be one. Please. Uh, rectify your your um, uh, your book, and both scorers need to to make the um, the uh, adjustment. That is how I do it at at club level. At the next interval, I just go uh, double check. I don't know, Tom, if you do it differently. I, I I don't like shouting from where I stand to the scorers. There, it looks a bit village if you if you do it. Is there another way do you, that you communicate that to the scorers? Uh, 
Uh, so Abdullah, in my 15 years of umpiring and over 30 years of watching cricket, I've never seen more than one short run on one delivery. Uh, and there's a reason for that is us as umpires, as soon as the player, either batter has turned short on a run, we call and not yet signal, but at least call short run for all the players on the field to be aware that there has been a short run. So if you call short run, I can guarantee you that the batters are going to make sure that the next uh, run in that particular delivery that they are running is not short. So that's why I've never seen more than one short run in the same delivery and I don't think I ever will see it. <laughs> uh, but if it were to happen, uh, then yes, I agree with you. The best way is to at the next interval go and communicate to the scorers to uh, just check how many runs they recorded for that particular delivery and um, if they need to subtract one further short run from their score then they can do so. Um, and Arun uh, related to this asks if a batsman runs two runs and both the runs are short how many runs should uh, be recorded. Uh, Arun just remember that the last run that a batter completes has to be a run. So uh, if they make good their ground uh, at the opposite end, then the the final run that they attempted will be a run. Uh, but if they attempted three runs and only completed one, then uh, one run will count. And again, you just need to confirm that with the scorers at the next interval. Okay, um, next question is from Kasim. And he says, how if both umpires have disagreements on some decisions during the game, what law is in this situation? Uh, I'm not sure which disagreements um, Kasim is asking about Abdullah, but I think we were dealing with ground, weather and mm. light. Uh, so maybe just shed some light on that. Uh, I'll, I'll cover both just in case he, uh, he's maybe referring to the other the uh, the other disagreement as well. But I'll, I'll cover uh, um, the um, ground with and light in a bit more detail. So, uh, Kasim, um, shukran for your question. So, uh, when the two umpires together they need to come make an inspection and yes there will be times where the umpires do disagree yes they are both looking at at the same uh, um, ground or weather conditions um, and let me use light as an example and i found it many a times the light would be fading and i would I would think, oh, I think this light is still good enough for, uh, for, for us to play in. My colleague would say, no, I think this is not good enough for us to, uh, to play in. So now the law guides us here. The law tells us if there is a disagreement and the umpires uh, do not agree, you need to suspend play immediately. Both needs to agree for play to continue. So in the light example, um, if there's a disagreement, you need to come off. If, if um, let's say that you do an inspection on the field, of uh, um, it's been raining and there's lots of water around and now you're doing your ground inspection. One of our fields, uh, I think uh, this field is not uh, ready to, to, uh, for play to start yet. The other of our fields, now I think it is ready. If there's a disagreement, law guides us, law tells us, both umpires need to agree. Both agree, play can start. If one disagree, we will not um, start play. So yeah, we 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 get guided. Any disagreement, uh, play will either not start, or if you're on the field of play and 
you need to come off, let's say for light, if one umpire say come off, law tells us you need to come off. Both needs to agree to stay on. If one is uh, disagree, then you need to come off. Um, the only thing I can think of the, the, the in terms of other uh, other decisions, uh, Tom, uh, um, I mean, we will handle that uh, in later laws where uh, when it comes to decisions that umpires needs to make uh, uh, court behind LBW stamping, um, the law guides us which umpire needs to make uh, um, which decisions, and we will cover that in full. That's the other thing I can think of. Uh, did I answer the, Did I answer his question, Tom? I think so. Thank you very much, Jula. Uh, next question is from Fayaz, and I'll take this one. How yes. is women's umpire career in South Africa? Uh, in our previous level one online course, um, we had uh, Lauren Achenbach as our poster lady. Uh, she is a 25 year old South African female umpire who started umpiring at the age of 18. And in seven years, she has done exceptionally well and um, umpired in the women's T20 World, sorry, 50 over World Cup final in New Zealand earlier this year. Um, so they do tend to fast track uh, female umpires in South Africa because uh, there is a shortage of female umpires in the world and the next women's T20 World Cup, which will be here in South Africa in 2023 January, if I'm not mistaken, they want all 16 umpires to be female umpires because obviously the players are all female. So why shouldn't the officials be all female? Um, so there is a drive around the world to recruit and develop female umpires. Um, so where it might take a male umpire like myself 10 years to get onto the uh, Cricket South Africa first class national panel, um, it uh, took uh, Lauren Achenbach um, five years to get onto the Cricket South Africa reserve list panel. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Fires. Um, and just to finish on that, um, Lauren is now making a living out of umpiring because she goes to tournaments around the world uh, where uh, females are playing. So it is becoming in increasingly popular um, career choice for for females. Next question is from JJ Erasmus. Um, and I'll give this one to you, Abdullah. The umpire approves the field as uh, good to play. And then a player gets injured. Who is responsible? Thank you for your question, JJ. Let me firstly start by saying that's why it's important for umpires when they do the uh, inspect, inspection, especially uh, when when uh, they uh, were they were rain around and conditions are let's say wet and and muddy. Before you decide to um, to let play start, be hundred percent sure that that according to you conditions um, conditions uh, are safe. To answer your question, so now you've decided that conditions um, conditions um, are safe, and now something happens to the uh, a player or a player uh, gets injured. Um, JJ, uh, if you decided conditions are safe and play gets injured, uh, you know injuries are a part of the game. Uh, I've seen injuries happen in uh, in dry weather, uh, Simon Jones in the SS test match in, in 40 degrees, injured um, his knee ligaments or tore his knee ligaments while fielding um, and it was the end of his career. So uh, so in, injuries do, do happen, okay, but um, in in way conditions uh, and rugby courses, 
give you our ethical conditions before you agree for a uh, play to start. I uh, don't know if you want to add anything here, Tom. I uh, no, fully agree, Abdullah. Um, I think we should always err on the side of caution and uh, make sure that the conditions are 100% uh, safe to play before uh, resuming or starting play. Um, next question is uh, quite a long scenario. Abdullah, um, in a school match restricted to 20 overs per side with the agreement of seven players per side, uh, team A are 90 all out. When team B is batting, in team A, let's say five of the bowlers are suspended for bowling waist height, non-pitching deliveries for the second instance and suspended from the bowling at the end of 12 overs. Now there are no more bowlers available to bowl. How can or should the match continue? Uh, if it can't continue, what is the result of the match? And this question comes from Kartik. Good question, Karthik. Let me think. Yeah. I think the uh, Karthik, uh, this match, uh, because the players, the bowlers were suspended, and um, if you are not left with any more bowlers, or those bowlers that are still left, bowl their quotas. Let's say they bowl their, their four overs max that they are allowed to bowl in a, in a T20 game. So now you sit, or are they allowed to bowl more overs in, a, in this game, seeing that they're only seven per... Uh, per side. But in any case, let's say they, they've bowled, the players that are left bowled their full quota, what maximum, whatever it is. And the rest are all suspended. So now you still need to bowl three or four more overs. Yeah. Yeah. For me, you've applied the playing conditions, you've suspended the bowlers. The, those bowlers are, according to the playing conditions, not allowed to bowl in this uh, particular uh, game uh, anymore. So this game is now is not able to continue. And we will now have to bring in, um, if your competition do play with Tuck with Lewis, or if your competition plays with average run rate, whatever the case is, uh, um, how Abdullah, you decide. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, let's take only the last, I mean, no DLS mentioned in the last or something like that say like out of 11 players nine got suspended now like only two left out wicket keeper and bowler are keep changing and bowling so it could result in time wasting also so it it looks it looks not right right so they can't keep changing and bowling actually it happens in one of the school match so that's why i'm asking so it becomes inconclusive so just want to know whether we need to continue or is, we need is to this, mark uh, the is, is this a limited over game or a more day cricket game, Karthik? No, say like uh, an innings is restricted to overs instead of, uh, I mean, as per law, for a certain period of time or for overs, here it is restricted to overs, say like 20 overs school kids. So unfortunately, they are beginners. They have ended up in bowling all non-pitching deliveries. Yes. So what happened is like no bowlers are, available at some yeah. point of time. Are, we were not able any, to complete that. Are there any restrictions on how many overs the bowler can bowl? No, as per law, even two bowlers can bowl. No restrictions. It is as per the okay, law, okay. say like. Yeah, 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 yeah then, it, right? okay, okay. I thought I thought this was a 20, a 20 over game, like, you know, T20 cricket where there's like a restriction. No, no, only the overs. innings is, only the innings is restricted yeah. to overs. Okay. It's not okay. T20. Okay. Uh, Kartik, you will have you will have to continue with the bowlers that you have. If there's two uh, uh, two bowlers uh, that's allowed to bowl, then they will have to complete the rest of the overs. Okay, Those if two anyone Those gets two suspended, bowlers. yeah. If any one of them also gets suspended, so should we have to report this match? Should we have to stop the match? Uh, because uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the game then cannot continue as per the playing conditions, but definitely the, uh, um, you will have to write a report here because for nine or ten bowlers to be suspended for bowling, I full tosses. Uh, um, there's definitely 
definitely something going on in this particular game. Okay. So, yeah, so that the game result... will definitely definitely have to be uh, have to be stopped. The report will have to be written to the the governing body, stating the um, what happened. Paulus being suspended, uh, where the game uh, stopped, um, and then the governing body will then have to make a decision on on the result of the game. I'm not sure if you okay. want to add something here, Tom. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah. In, uh... Western Province Cricket Association, uh, the matter would be reported uh, to the governing body and uh, the local leagues committee would have to come to a decision as to what punishment is carried out to the offending side and what the result of the match would be as well. Um, there's nothing really I can think of in the laws that tells us uh, what we would uh, give this result of this particular uh, match um, and nothing in our playing conditions or bylaws as well that um, covers this uh, very strange uh, condition. So it would probably be written into the following season's uh, bylaws because uh, that's how no, bylaws are, and those playing are not conditions. willful ones. These are kids, you know, right? Kids are bound to bowl such deliveries. They are beginners, they just want to play the match. These are very young kids. So nothing is willfully directed to the striker. I mean, willfully delivered to the striker. So say like, these are not intentional ones. So I was just curious to know the result of the match. So because what La is telling is like by agreement, if a match is reduced to fewer than or the original number of nominated players, it should continue as long as possible according to the agreement or laws. So. That's why. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Kartik. Um, uh, Norbert has just asked me to email him course material. I have done so. Uh, anybody else who has not received course material, you can just put your email address in the chat box and I'll send you the course material after the lecture. Um, Kartik, uh, your next question is about the one of the captains have nominated only seven players and submitted the list to one of the umpires. The list is incomplete. Before the toss, the captain wants to add four more players. Um, does that require the consent of the opposing captain? Um, so in western let Province me, cricket let me make that more clear uh, let me make that more clear for everyone the scheduled start of the match is 9 30 a.m say the task should be ideally from 9 to 9 20. so what what happened is like um, he has given the the captain has completed the nomination in writing say at nine o'clock only seven players were nominated so we are calling him for toss at 9 15 and at that time by seeing four players are arriving to the ground He's telling, sir, I want to add four more players. Uh, give me the list, he's asking. So he is trying to make changes to the nomination. So though it is not a replacement, it is an addition to the nomination. So should we have to get the consent of opposing captain? Um, the match so, is technically not started. Yeah. Um, so the team sheet or the nomination list only needs to be submitted at the toss. So, Absolutely, no task happened before the task is asked. So, um, Abdullah, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the, I think they can change the team list, the nomination list, um, without the consent of the uh, opposing captain uh, any time up until the toss. Um, so, um, I don't think uh, we need the consent of the opposing captain. Uh, what the one thing I will say is that um, in Western Province Cricket Association, uh, we have a, a bylaw that the team sheet should be completed with 11 names on it, whether the players are there or not. Uh, at the toss, when you submit the nomination list, the team sheet needs to be complete. So umpires will not accept an incomplete 
team sheet. Yes, Tom, you're right. As long as that toss hasn't taken place, uh, no need to get consent from the opposing captain. And I would also insist on uh, the, the captain writing 11 players, 11 players on, on the team, um, on the seat. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Uh, uh, hey, Tom, this is Vijay. Yes, Vijay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, in the on the previous question of Karthik's, where the bowlers were suspended repeatedly and there are no enough bowlers to bowl, can the captain concede the game in that case? Uh, yes, captain can concede the game at any point that he or she wishes. Okay. I mean, if he doesn't concede, then the game can't proceed. In which case, yeah, I mean, it is difficult to award the match to the other side. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Right. Um, Our, the issue is if he doesn't concede. Okay. So that's when uh, the situation becomes difficult for umpires. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I mean, maybe you guys can tell it. Guys, like I mentioned, I, that that decision would have to be made by the um, the, the the governing body in charge of uh, the match uh, because it's not written in the laws uh, or uh, in any playing conditions that I know of cover that scenario. Uh, next question is again from Kartik. A nominated player is batting and concussed when the score is 20 for two. The opposing captain has given the consent and now the replacement player is telling the umpires that he wants to bat down the order and not immediately. Is this permitted, Abdullah? Yes, Karthik, as per the playing condition, the, play, the, the replacement player does not have to bat immediately. The replacement player can bat uh, um, anywhere. Uh, in any case, if the replacement player is um, um, is replacing the uh, a concussed player, so and if they're batting at the sides uh, at um, at that stage, so I would think, let's say, batter gets hit against the head, batter needs to leave the field to uh, um, to get treatment, gets checked for concussion. Next batter would he would in any case have to come in. Um, the medical doctor uh, confirms players concussed, player then gets uh, replaced, but the new batter already replaced uh, or went, in, uh, went into bat, not the replacement player, but the next batter in the lineup. So according to the laws, the, um, the, the um, next batter needs to be... Uh, Abdullah, uh, sorry, let me, I think the question was misunderstood. Okay. Uh, see, like... Uh, the Quentin Decock is batting and Quentin Decock is concussed. He is no more part of the match. He is ruled out of the match. Yeah. And Bauma is asking for the replacement. And now they had given Dean Elgar as replacement. So ideally, his innings is not completed. Say he's yeah. 10 not out, something like that. So now, ideally, Dean Elgar should resume the batting, right? Otherwise, it is considered as a retirement. Yeah, so to answer, yeah, so answer your question, so Dean Elgar's replacing Quentin as a concussion replacement. And, Absolutely. Last. Yeah, and Dean does not have to, to bat immediately. Dean can bat anywhere in the order, to answer your question. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question is JJ Erasmus again. Uh, what if a player is out according to the bowler, but the umpire does not give that batter out and the fielding side decides to leave the field because they believe the umpire is biased? Are they allowed to leave the field? Abdullah? At, I'm not sure if Jay is now referring to player. Um, the the stand-in umpire that, that is a... Um, uh, that one, one of the members of the bat, yeah, of the 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 batting side. If they, yeah. um, but I'll answer both uh, uh, both sides. So uh, that's why I mentioned earlier that if an umpire gets injured and and um, a replacement is is needed, 
and you cannot get an official uh, um, um, umpire, you will use one of the uh, players of the batting side. But that player will only stand um, at the striker's end. The official umpire will, for the rest of the game, do bowlers in, bowlers in at, at both sides. The um, and um, if um, if if the um, if let's say it's two official umpires, and the fielding side feels that one of the official umpires is biased towards the fielding side, and then they do decide to leave the uh, the match. Remember, these are two official umpires appointed by the uh, governing body, and these two official umpires uh, uh, um, should be, you know, unbiased or Im impartial. Now, if they do the, the leave, uh, decide to leave uh, uh, the field and not continue playing, they're leaving themselves open for the game to be awarded to the other side. There is a section in the law where you can award the, the game if the one side refuses to play. So if the, if the opinion of the umpires, the one side refuses to play, the umpires do have the power, according to the laws of cricket, to award the, the, the match to the other side. So... Players, uh, fielding teams, or even uh, teams need to be careful for not just decided that they want to play. I'm leaving the field. There is a section in the law that allow that allows awarding of the game to the other side if one side refuses to play. Did I answer the question, Tom? Uh, perfectly so, Abdullah. Um, JJ, you've got your hand up. You want to? Thank you very much. I. I appreciate it. I understand it clearly now. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Next question is from Kennedy. Uh, style of signaling. Is it possible to create your own style of signaling? Abdullah, I think you mentioned that. We can just repeat the Billy Barden story. Uh, yes, uh, Kennedy. Um, actually, from the ICC, the ICC uh, actually ask us that when we do train umpires to, to keep the signaling as simple as as possible. Um, they, you should not, you shouldn't uh, try to copy a a Billy Bowden in uh, in in signaling, and uh, and uh, even back in my my playing days, I I, I saw one or two umpires uh, try to. To be eccentric and try to uh, to copy a, uh, a Billy Bowden type of signaling, and and at, at the time they thought it was uh, was funny the type of signaling. Uh, but what tends to happen was the moment they get a decision wrong on the field of play, the players then start nailing that particular umpire. You are trying to be a clown. You are trying to to be funny with your signaling instead of focusing on signaling signaling get your decisions right. So that happened every time that umpire gets a decision wrong, players would chirp the umpire uh, to rather focus on getting your decisions right than trying to be a clown on the field. Players would laugh, players would see you a clown. So that is just in my playing day, the one or two umpires that try to, to copy a, a Billy Bowden. But to come back to answer your question from the ICC, that we we get instructed that when it comes to signaling, um, signaling should be as simple as but you should keep it, you know, simple. Um, and like as I said, I uh, I like the way Kumar Damasena uh, signal for me. That's a uh, uh, copybook uh, 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 signaling. But yeah, keep it simple. Do not try to copy a Billy Bowden. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tila. Next question is from Kartik again. Before the match, both the captains have agreed not to demand the new ball at the start of a new innings. Uh, though surrendered the right, the fielding captain is coming with a new ball and seeing, and the batter seeing this tells him he cannot start the innings with the new ball. 
Can the umpires permit the new ball or not? Uh, okay. Let, yeah. Let me let me summarize that. Yeah. Before the uh, task, there yeah, both the captains are submitting. I mean, telling that sir, we are not going to demand the new ball at the start of each, each innings. It means that they will be starting their innings with the old ball. Now, like uh, he is coming up with the old ball. Ball bowler is coming up with the old ball. So what happened is like uh, a batter seeing that and telling, okay, sir, let him bowl with that like that he is telling. So is this permitted? You got it, right? So agreement is not to use the new ball at the start of new innings, but irrespective of surrendering the right of demanding a new ball, bowling team is coming with a new ball. By seeing that batter is telling, okay, sir, let him start the innings with the new ball. So do can we permit this? Abdullah, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'll take it. Thanks, Kartik. Uh, Kartik, for me, the agreement before the game was not um, to allow not using uh, new balls. If we're now suddenly going to allow for uh, for conditions to be, uh, be changed as the game evolves, you're just opening yourself up for a messy, uh, messy situation. So I would say both captains agreed that we should not be using a new ball. I would not allow the use of of a, a new ball because that was the agreement before the game started. Uh, we cannot now, as the game progress, suddenly decides to change agreement as as we as we uh, see fit. So I would stuck with the agreement that was made. Both captains made it that we not uh, they happy not to utilize a new ball. I would stuck to to that agreement that was made by both captains. I agree with you, Tula, 100%. Uh, last question from Kartik. The striker is trying to avoid the bouncer by taking the right hand off the bat. In doing so, the right hand glove worn is touching the left hand glove, which is also worn. And the ball touches the right-handed glove, which is not holding the bat, and subsequently held by the wicketkeeper fairly. Is this considered as making contact with the bat, Abdullah? Kartik, answer your question, no. It's not considered touching the bat. Why? The law guides us here. The law tells us. And needs to be holding the bat. That is what you need to look for. So, was the hand, when the ball touched the glove, was that particular hand in contact with the bat? If your answer to that question is yes, you give the batter out. If the answer to that question is no, not out. So, so oh. listening to your question, the hand which the ball touched, or the glove at which the ball touched, was not holding the bat or not in contact with the bat at that particular time. Yes, it was in contact with the other glove, but it was not in contact with the bat. So according to the laws of cricket, uh, uh, in no, your scenario, not out. No, the hand which is holding the bat is bad, right? He's, he has, the glove is worn and he is holding the bat with that hand. So that is considered as bat. That glove is considered as the bat. So he is just taking the, say his right hand or batsman, say he is taking his right hand away. In the process of doing that, this right hand is touching the left hand, which is holding the bat. So even though technically that glove, left hand glove, which is in contact with the bat is bat, right? Uh, so Karthik, I'm, I'm gonna ask you the question. The hand that's um, the glove that's touching the ball is that hand or in contact with the with the bat? Yes or no? Okay, let me let me explain you, Abdullah. Maybe if you read, you may get confused. Say like uh, right-handed right-handed batsman. Okay, his left hand is in contact with the bat. Okay, there is a bouncer. He is just taking his right hand to avoid being hit. What happened is like while taking the right hand. That right hand is touching the left hand, which is holding the bat. The ball hits the right hand. 
and went to the keeper, which is subsequently held as, I mean, which which was a fair catch. It was not grounded before being held by him. Uh, Kartik, um, yeah, I think it's quite clear. The right hand is not holding the bat, so not out. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Um, last question that I see, uh, there's quite a few of you asking for course material. I'll send that. Uh, Sartur Ghana, is there any official signal for the disallowment of runs, Abdullah? So the 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 signal that uh, that we usually use for when there's runs disallowed is we use the dead ball signal for this, and then uh, subsequent with this or adding to this dead ball signal, we send the batters back to their original ends, and these two signals are usually a cue. They need to be together, and they a cue for the scorers that runs were disallowed because why would we send batters back to the original end? So we will use the dead ball signal in conjunction with the sending batters back to the original end and that usually indicates to the scorers that runs were disallowed. But 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 do make a note in your book uh, the over the ball and the time. So at the next interval, let's go make um, this double check um, that the scorers recorded uh, the number of runs for that particular ball correctly. And in, in, in this case, you said disallowing of runs, so there shouldn't be any runs or, or zero runs from that particular ball. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dulap. Perfectly answered as always. I do not see Thank you. any Thank you. more questions in the chat box. Um, are there any further questions? If so, please raise your hand and I shall give you the floor. Uh, if not, I would like to thank everybody for your attendance. It's a very long first lecture uh, because of the uh, many interesting questions that we fielded. Uh, that's how we all learn. Uh, thank you for your interaction and your participation and we shall meet up again uh, same time on Wednesday, I will be um, sending uh, the recording of this lecture in about two hours time uh, or tomorrow morning and we shall join up again on Wednesday. Thank you and good night. Good night everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, Amo. Yep. Thank you all. Good night.